All right, my friends, welcome to episode 298 of Life in the Stocks. My name's Matt Stocks. This is my podcast. Thank you for pressing play. Uh, I've just had a tooth extracted and it's really painful and difficult to talk. So I'm going to try and get through this intro without fumbling my words. Um, Let's just get straight to the guest, shall we? What a legend this man is. Uh, He has been in two of, I think, the greatest, well, not just I, many people. Indeed, this is probably common theory and belief. Uh, The replacements and Guns N' Roses are indeed two of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. One of them is world-renowned and internationally celebrated. See the tooth gun there. And the other, I think, is the most underrated band in the history of rock and roll. You can guess which one is which, of course. If you don't know the replacements, I've made a playlist of of some of my favourite replacement songs. I also have made a playlist of some of my favourite Husker Do songs, as well as a little throwback to Greg Norton, who was on the show last week as well. So if you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those social media platforms, hit the link tree, which I have in my bio, and that'll take you to my Spotify page. Uh, And on there, you can dive in and explore the wonderful world of both The Replacements and Husker Do, two of the great alternative rock bands, and two bands that really sowed the seeds and inspired so many acts that followed and got so much bigger than they did. Um, But sometimes when you're the first ones through the gate, you know, you don't get the recognition and the success that the people who follow you do. But that's just, you know, that's the way things go. So Tommy Stinson, who was in both the replacements from their inception to their recent reunion, well, I say recent reunion tour, eight years ago it was. And as Tommy points out in this chat, there likely will not be another, which breaks my heart because I never got to see them. uh, And it looks like I never will. Um, But, you know, never say never, I guess the saying goes. And then... After that, he was also in Guns N' Roses from 1998 to 2014, which makes Tommy the longest-serving member of Guns N' Roses other than Axl Rose and Dizzy Reed, which is pretty amazing. Uh, It was an honor and a pleasure to have Tommy on the show. We had a wonderful conversation. Uh, We spoke all about... Well, at the start, we talked about our mutual friend Jesse Malin, and this conversation was actually recorded before... Jesse had his stroke um, and I actually strangely enough got a lovely lovely text from Jesse today his spirits are high and um, it really was lovely to hear from him so we started off talking about Jesse uh, and then that strangely although Jesse hadn't fallen on his own ill health yet when the conversation took place it kind of just led to a conversation about health and the wear and tear of, of life on the road Uh, And then that was a springboard straight into the state of kind of America and indeed the world in a post-COVID world. Um, And that led me and Tommy into a discussion about just the state of the universe, really. Right out the gate, we got deep, which I always enjoy. Uh, And then we kind of reined it back in and and spoke about Tommy's upbringing and his time in the replacements and uh, the legacy of that band and how he wound up in Guns N' Roses and the whole Chinese democracy saga, uh, which Tommy had a front row seat for the whole thing. So who better to ask, really? And then we talked all about his his relationship and friendship with Axl Rose and the Replacements reunion and the Bash and Pop project, which is a fantastic project as well. Definitely worth checking out if you like the Replacements. Uh, and his solo albums as well. And his latest solo album, Ronga, is out now. So be sure to check that out as well. It's brilliant. And then he just casually drops stories about his friendship with the likes of Tom Waits and Bob Dylan towards the end of the chat as well. So this is a rock and roll legend right here, ladies and gentlemen. I don't mind telling you. And uh, yeah, like I said, a thrill and an honor to have him on the show. So without further ado, please enjoy episode 298 of Life in the Stocks with Tommy Stinson. Here we go. Tommy. Hey. 
Are we oh, doing? I, is this a? Is this an audio and a video? Uh, I only put out the audio, but um, it would okay. be nice to see you if you want to be. All right. <laughs> on camera. Good Howdy. to meet you, brother. How you doing? Doing good. Lovely no complaint. Stuff. Yeah, good. I like to hear that. I got an awful head cold, so if I sound and look like shit, that's why. But uh, we, no worries. Sorry well, about we that. Soldier on. I'm thrilled to be talking to you. Um, you are a very good friend of Jesse Malin, I gather. Correct. Correct. And I love that man so much. I wrote during the pandemic uh, a couple of books to kind of kill the time and you know do something productive. And Jesse very kindly wrote the foreword to the first one. And, um, oh, nice. Yeah, he's been a, a real champion and, and friend of mine for several years now. What a very guy. Cool. I actually spoke to him recently because I was, you know, running a few hypothetical theories in my head. And I was like, he should have his own podcast. Like, if there's anybody that should have one, it should be <laughs> him with his stories and connections and way he has of, of bringing people together. So I called him up to tell him that and just said, you can, you know, do, do with that thought what you will. But yeah. I believe you should let it percolate. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Were you just over here with him recently? Am I right in thinking that I was away when he was over touring? I know you've done some U U.S. dates together, but yeah, no, um, I had to cancel that bit. I was going to come over there and do the European run with him, but I, I ended up having a having to have my hip, my hip replaced. I had to I had to bail out on it. Um, but yeah. how how was that brutal? You know, interesting. It's funny how quickly you get back on your feet once they, once you do it. Um, weirdly enough, uh, yeah, I came up from Spain last November, and my, my hip was jacked from from whatever. I think forty years of doing this, you know, jumping around on stage and all this, that, and everything. Travel traveling is a lot harder than people know, unless you've traveled to know. Um, as far as you know, sitting there for hours on end and shit, but. Um, yeah, that happened, you know, and uh, yeah, back, back up on my feet walking around. It's like you got a hunk of metal inside me now. <laughs> yeah, you, you touch on something interesting there because, um, you know, unless you're, and obviously you will have been in bands at points in time where you are traveling in luxury, but mm -hmm. for the large part, when you're a touring and traveling musician, as you say, it's you're in confined spaces a lot of the time. There's the stage yeah. show and the physicality of that, obviously, but there's everything that comes with, you know, touring. And as yeah. you say, after four decades of that, that's going to take its toll, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, and it really doesn't come down to first class or, you know, coach class in that regard. Sitting around, um, you know, waiting to play and traveling is, it's a lot. It's a, and, you know, especially flying 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 is brutal no matter how you slice that up so <clears throat> you know i think uh yeah i didn't you know i didn't get the memo about that until uh last november well your body lets you know doesn't it your body yeah. lets you know and it is good in that regard um you know it exactly. kind of gives you the heads up most of the time before exactly. it's too late <laughs> exactly exactly where's home for you now you're not in in minnesota anymore no no i'm in hudson new york i've been there for Gosh, 12 years now. What 12. was the inspiration to make the move out there? Um, so my ex-wife had an uncle up there, an art collector, um, Uncle Albert, funny enough. Hence the Beatles song, funny enough. Um, <laughs> um, and we, we, were, we were helping him, you know, divest some of, his, some of his collection over the course of a couple of years. And we'd come and... Chip Roberts and I, who's in the Cowboys and Campfire with me, he and I were trans, trans, transporting ourselves and artwork back and forth from Philly to Hudson um, to to work the stuff out. And after going there a bunch of times, we kind of we both kind of liked the town, and um, and I had the you know the idea of moving there because it seemed like it was a good little town to move to, and it was. I'm quaint and centrally located to airports and all that stuff. So I could do what I had to do and uh, yeah, moved there and I still love it. It's changed a lot, but, and it's changed a lot in a short amount of time, but still a good little town. Yeah. I've got a good friend who lives in Woodstock and um, I was out there with him last November, spent a few days out there. We went hiking up in the Catskills and drove all around. And I gather that's not too far 
from where you are. No, at. it's it's all same area. Yeah, yeah, and, and just the it still has, as you say, every, everything has changed. I think in recent years, gentrification kind of seeps in everywhere, but yeah. that that area does seem to withstand that kind of development. I think more so than most places I've been. And and it, it certainly attracts, I think, a certain type of artistic that that hippie culture is still there. I think, and um, some yeah. of the most beautiful people I've ever met I was only there a short space of time, but everybody that was there, I think, had been either you know inspired to move there or stayed there for similar reasons, and so it attracts fairly like minded people. And some of the houses up there, man, are absolutely beautiful as well. Like you don't really get homes like that in the UK. That kind of woodlandy yeah. cabin vibe yeah exactly <laughs> totally no it's 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 you know it's got that rustic vibe about it for sure um but yeah it's been gentrified my little town got gentrified pretty pretty hardcore as of late with covid and all that and even before covid it was starting but when the new york times calls your you know little town a destination spot three two or three years in the row running i think that's bound to happen the word gets yeah. out doesn't it yeah Exactly. It's like anything, right? It's good before everybody finds out. <laughs> exactly. And then everyone finds out and then holy shit. <laughs> what exactly. is, um, what's Minnesota like these days? Do you ever get back there? Is there any reason to get back there? I do. Other than perhaps if you're playing shows, like do you go back and spend proper time back there? Yeah, I go back and spend time with my family, you know, once or twice a year when I get around to it. And then I play shows there as well. Um, but you know, like a lot of cities that I know and have been in a billion times, everything is changing in a way. And it's slowly coming back from, from everything that happened from COVID and everything that happened from the George Floyd uh, murder. Um, it really changed a lot of cities. Uh, and Minneapolis um, is still years away from recovering from it. It, uh, what it what it did to that city is is a shame um and and, and at every level pretty much but uh so but are you talking I, about culturally as well as economically then both both yeah um both hand in hand um but like i said you know it, it's slowly coming back around and um and quite frankly other places I've been in the country, you know, traveling around and stuff like that have suffered the same sort of plight, uh, whether it's homelessness, um, poverty, things like that. It, it, between COVID, George Floyd, and other instances like that, and Trump presidency, it has torn up a good part of most every major city in the country. And I guess that's what they're hoping is going to be done, tr Donald Trump's, you know, uh, plan is to tear down the big cities for the rural people to get their way i guess would be the you know the rural rednecks the the racists and the anti-semites i think he's really kind of making a play to <laughs> make this their world somehow you know that's not going to happen but you can see it in every city in the country right now yeah we have a similar situation happening here obviously every country is different and has its own idiosyncrasies and um, you know, unique, inherent flaws, but there's definitely, I think, a worldwide trend going on in that regard. Yeah, of um, division and a lot yeah. of the people that I know as well in recent times. It's it's on a mass scale, but it's also on like an insular level as well. And you see families getting, you know, kind of torn apart by different members of the family having different beliefs. And you know, I think whereas before we could sit around to a large extent right most families had that ability to sit over the dinner table at you know occasions like say christmas or thanksgiving where you are and discuss differences of opinion intellectually and with with open ears but i feel like now it's um you know harder to do that yeah. a lot of people rush for the the fallout mode yeah a lot faster oh i i know i know several people whose families have totally shut the bath over it completely um and it's, unfo it's unfortunate that it's um, it, it, what it, what it's what it's coming from is what it's really unfortunate. But the realities of it is it's always been there. But that uh, that Trump was able to give validity to the, just the 
such an extreme insanity. And, and I'll be honest with you, it comes from both sides over here um, anyway, but, yeah. but really it's, um, you know, the, the left has their issues too, but really the stuff that, you know, is really plaguing in our society is really just, uh, it comes down to, I think, mental wellness. I mean, it's really not, it's not steeped in any realities, most of, most all of it. And you can't help but think, wow, this is red and this is white, but, but no, that isn't red. That's, you know, it, it's, you know, that's the color of red. It might be a shade of red, but that's fucking red. This is white. I mean, so you got two people looking at the same thing, but you get the, you know, people in the far right just going, no, that's not red. That's not how, you know, it's, God says it's, you know, it's like, and make up this whole other fucking crazy theory about, you know, one thing or the other. And it, it's unfortunate. I don't, I don't, they don't hear that so much from the right in that regard. But man, the, the, what's making it up right now is just so out, outer, outer perimeter. Like, 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 are you from fucking Mars or, you know what I mean? But, um, and it's unfortunate because it's, you know, in my lifetime, you know, I'm 56 years old, I'm watching this stuff going, wow. This is the most insane period of, of being an adult I can ever imagine, you know. Um, but it is it is what it is, you know. Well, you have had quite the life, man. Um, and going back to kind of starting out, like for you as a kid growing up, how was, you know, your family situation and the cultural landscape at that time from what you remember, um, I guess, sort of 70s period um, yeah. in Minneapolis? What are some of your earliest memories of formative experiences that shaped the young adult you would go on to be like, was that was the home situation a happy one or no no our home situation was you know we were poor my mom worked all the time we were you know child of divorce i mean shit my parents weren't even married when they had me um my little sister and i were both born out of wedlock um not a whole lot of um uh good role models really you know growing up and you know, until my brother came and came back home from, you know, an extended stay in a group home for boys, um, did I get any kind of guide rail, guardrails, you know, to, or anything to, you know, grab onto of interest, you know, um, I was pretty much just a fucking thieving little kid, you know, I've been in jail three times by the time I was 10, you know. Before um, you were 10, wow. Yeah. What for, like, misdemeanor stuff, like, just shoplifting and, and yeah. you know hoodlum just bullshit um getting in trouble skipping school you know all that kind of crap but uh yeah it still was early and uh you know luckily i lived through that but yeah back to our family life wasn't that wasn't a good one so and, when you say your brother you're talking about bob so he was kind of a a father type figure to you was he because of the age difference and well not so much a father type just more of an older brother that had sort of more of a plan he had a plan right. to get out of it. He wanted, you know, um, music was our was our exit strategy from, you know, that crappy life we were living up, up to that point. And it took a therapist to tell me that, you know, that yeah, he came for you for a reason, you know. I was like, cool, good, to, good to think about it like that, <laughs> you know. I feel like a lot um, of bands who were starting out then, um, for them, music was that whether they, even they were in bands or not, or whether they just, you know, aligned to the scene, it feels like at that time, like the kind of birth of, of underground DIY music was such an escape for so many kids from, you know, broken homes and just bad oh, situations. Yeah. It often I mean, didn't it hope in a way out. Totally. I mean, if you think of it in terms of, you can go, you can go look at the vastness of art in general comes from that. I think if you really look at it, um, you know, there, there, of course there are exceptions to everything, but when you really think about art and what creates art, it comes from pain. A lot of it, a lot of it's from pain and suffering and, and that one way or the other. And so I don't think music's all that different. I think in my case, and just because I've been talking about Minneapolis a lot, um, it had it had a profound effect when they desegregated the school, the public school system, um, in the late seventies. It really changed the dynamic of city life in a way, and and that was a good thing in my mind. 
but we're living through that again only i think hyper focused on you know the people that live in rural communities idea of what we're doing in the cities is and i think you know that's where the far right gets all that crazy thinking from it's like wow they're 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 mixing races in the cities and they're doing all this and they're doing all that and we're we're getting outnumbered as white people all this crap all this replacement theory crap and you just kind of go that's evolution man like that's like fucking how the world got fucking here like what are you talking about <laughs> that this is a problem you know well you can't but, reverse um, time can you so a phrase no. that make america great again and we have a similar thing over here with this idea of you know like a an old britain it's gone those eras are gone those times are gone and, yeah and they, they you know they weren't they weren't worth the fucking weight they carried to begin with because you got to think of what you know, what we are here on this planet but uh, without going on a tangent on that where i was going with that is that um what made i think it, it had a lot to do with like i said the desegregating of the public school systems um in the 70s especially in minneapolis's case um why our you know our music scene was so vibrant in the in the, in the 80s early early 80s late 70s you know going into the 80s um it, it it had a lot to do with that i think because you had did have a lot of you know different you know kids getting shipped all over town to get an equal education in all the communities because we had such and minnesota was one of the one of the later um states in the union to desegregate their schools so you know i think it happened like in 78 in fact but um i'd have to i read about this like a year ago so i might be wrong on the number of that but i was 77 78 when we finally re desegregated them after starting the process in the early 70s around 71 or something like that but because of that i think that's how like um you know you'd have punk rock bands or you know um and, and then prints across the, town it's incredible oh, yeah, isn't it exactly and you and you had art bands and you had you know a little of this all of it kind of converging on downtown minneapolis and um and we all hung out together we all went to parties together we all liked certain things about each other's music but we also com we were also it was a healthy competition amongst everyone in a way but, but i really do think when you think in minneapolis in terms of that i think it was part and parcel for at least what i think my experience was was the desegregating school system but also prints you know coming from that you know the the 70s and that and and what happened in the early 80s with that i think it all came from from that kind of experience which brought everyone together and brought this sort of vibrant multicultural city <laughs> um you know to, a, to have a i've never i haven't witnessed the city since um that had such a vibrant music scene as we had back in the 80s like the early 80s and stuff there I mean, it really was when i look back at it it was a really fucking magical time um with all the different kind of music people were getting into and the record store there that was our our main you know sort of musical uh you know musical hub center of all that was cool and everything you know or folk jokopus um and the people that worked there uh it, it was it was a magical thing and i like i said we, we we traveled around you know like boston had um you know a thing kind of going like that with different record store chains or different record stores and stuff like that and different cities had that going on but nothing like minneapolis and i haven't seen anything like it since you know did the replacements ever share an early stage with prince did that ever happen no no we um he was already quite big when we were getting we we're getting going he yeah. was already probably playing um, arenas at that point pretty much did you ever cross paths with him yeah i mean you know got nothing more out of him hey man how you doing you know that kind of thing but um but that's all really anyone got one unless you're really in his inner circle yeah. he's a very private guy very private guy and uh um you know i think that was part of his you know part of his myst his mystique you know that he was so private well same with axel you know like so few people outside of his circle know anything about him and that's what i think makes people so curious 
and there's very few stars in the age of social media there's very few stars like that left because everything's so accessible now you can kind of go on instagram and you know see the biggest pop star in the world and what they had for lunch but those yeah. kind of cats are of a whole different walk of life aren't they yeah yeah and i you know what makes that up i don't understand or i don't even i don't even i don't know where it comes from um you know whether it's a I'm, I'm a very social person i don't really i i get out and i'm i don't i don't i've never really had a desire to be a pop star or anything like that really but um i i, I look at it a little bit different than than all that but yeah you know i guess that is why people you know are curious about axel i mean there's a lot there <laughs> there sure is I can, there. I can imagine there is what about paul when does he join the fold when do you guys get together with him and when does the band you know start becoming the band that would become what it was because you know for me um and i had greg norton on the show recently and there's those kind of bands of that time husker do obviously minutemen replacements uh meat puppets for me they were like the stepping stone between black flag and the hardcore scene and then nirvana and that massive kind of indie alternative scene and, and those four bands were like the big four of that transitional period for me that made some of the most vital and interesting and amazing records of that time and they still sound so great um and it's the unique chemistry i think of those involved yeah it i mean totally i mean there was a you know the underground musical explosion that happened you know then it was, it was pretty pretty uh, unique to that time i don't know exactly why but I think there was, you know, I think people were pining for something more than just glitz, glamour, pop music, you know, rock and roll shenanigans and things like that. I think people gotten over the the pomp and circumstance of it, of it all and wanted to see something, you know, more real um, uh, with real emotion behind it. And also, uh, you know, it, I think it always somewhat reflects the, the times as well, you know. Um, was a and for us we were um completely uh we could give a fuck about what was happening in our government we were like we it just it's so um we were just living and sustaining the best we could um just not even being aware of the fact that we could actually do anything about you know what was going on in the world around us it wasn't even a thing it didn't matter back then but you know it got to matter pretty quickly the older i got um but yeah yeah and i think that was you know i think there was a lot of people that you know if you think about that era of the reagan years and stuff like that i think there's a lot of bands that came out of that um you know we we're all sort of <laughs> sort of a land of misfit toys if you will you know just kind of had our own um view on life in the world anti-politics you know all that well i think what was really interesting about you guys is you had a broader musical scope of influences which stood you apart from from you know the likes of black flag and and those earlier hardcore bands and so you were playing with a similar energy but you had much more taste and an interest feeding into what you were doing um <laughs> how was the dynamics within the group early on like was there always tension there or did that come later on as as you know the pressures of growing as a band you know caved in on you all or was that tech creative and personal tension kind of always there you know more so for paul and bob i think than than than, than any of us i think they you know they butted heads quite a bit um in a healthy way really i mean you know he, he, Paul became the leader of the band because he was singing the songs and writing the song and stuff. And I think Paul, Bob kind of, you know, wanted to, wanted to do the same, but didn't really have the, you know, that in him. He was a guitar player, you know. Um, so, you know, we had, we had a little bit of that going on with those two. But, um, yeah, from, from, from that point on, we all got along pretty good, you know. And was drinking a big part of the group? I know you were a bit younger than the rest of the guys. Was drinking yeah. and partying a big part of it from the start as well? Because obviously that's pretty kind much, of a, pretty much you that's followed that band around, isn't it? <laughs> from day one, from day one, it was a, 
our 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 muse and our vice and our downfall all at once, you know, um, all of that. But you know, everyone was going through that, and that was what the eighties were all about for so many bands, so many people I know. Yeah, where are you at with uh, it now? Do you drink these days? No, I do not. Um, I do not, and I don't imbibe any of that crap anymore. But you know, um, came and went, did a thing, and um, you know, it's good to be on the other side of it. Yeah, I can actually, I can actually wake up and talk to fucking someone in England in the morning. You know. Yeah, well, thank you for getting up early, man. It's uh, when I, I saw had, the times. I, was I like, had to talk to Spain going? before no, you. <laughs> you did. You, so you're 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 in the throes of it right now, are you? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I appreciate the time, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, I was reading about your uh, notorious SNL performance because um, I spoke to Jesse about the Fear performance and and when all the New York kids went down and and that's kind of become the stuff of legend and uh, and your guys' performance on there was it Harry Dean Stanton who was the host? Yeah, for that one. Yeah, Did you get yeah. to spend some time with him? He for me is one of those iconic character actor types that um, just has so much enigma and aura about him, and I gather he was quite the the Hellraiser. Well, till you, the end. you know, a sweet, sweet guy. I mean, I, I, um, I very, I, he, we only saw him for a moment, and I met him years later in LA when I moved there. I saw him because he used to play at this place called uh, Jack Sugar Shack. Uh, yeah, he's got week, a really cool when, voice, hasn't he? He does like kind of country, yeah. country stuff. Yeah, he said he's, he do play there like once a week, but it was a, it was a cool bit. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know that whole thing. He, you know, we got we got kind of cake on our face for that because you know we let him drink in our dressing room whereas they did not tell us that they didn't put booze in his dressing room because they were afraid he would get drunk well when he walked in where do you think he went where the drinks were we had that on a rider it was right there in our room so of course he got drunk in our room and so we didn't know <laughs> but that's how it went down and we got blamed for it when your when your brother left the band, was it hard for you to kind of, you know, stay in it? Did you feel conflicted? I was conflicted, but we were all conflicted because none of us really wanted it to happen. But it became apparent that well, we either break up or we, you know, or we we get rid of Bob because it was just it was tearing us apart, um, and. We sent him to rehab. Um, we tried our best to kind of help get him sobered up, even though none of us were going to be sober. And it didn't work. And, you know, it took him, you know, years to come to terms with all that and then no shit. Okay, that's what happened. Um, but, yeah, it was it was a bummer, of course. Did you remain close with him after he left or did it kind of affect your... Oh, it definitely affected us. I, you know, I'd see him at holidays and stuff because I'd already, I moved away from Minnesota in 93 <clears throat> uh, and moved to, moved to LA. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, because mostly just out of, you know, being in another state, I didn't really see him all that much after that. But it definitely made it awkward at family gatherings. Totally. How do you feel about the legacy of, of the band? Um, obviously, you know, you've got to do the reunion uh, moments and kind of, you know, I guess get closure in regards to certain things. But And, and musically, obviously, you know, the, the discography is untouchable, but are there things you wish would have happened differently or are you at peace and, and content with what the replacements did and and your involvement in all of it? I'm, I'm totally at peace with it. I, I think we we did what we did. People People still revere it as something special. I think, you know, um, not a lot of people leave a legacy like that. So I'll take it. And I think, um, and, we, and I respect it. It's, we, we, there's, a, there's a good story there um, about, you know, four fucking young social malcontents uh, that uh, evolved into the people we become. And I, I think it's, you know, it's a good story. I think we're lucky as fuck you know in a lot of ways that we were able to do that when i look back at it um but ultimately you know that's, that's a good thing i <laughs> i don't think we could have done anything different i think we've always kind of worked from a <laughs> um 
in a way we're working in the negative towards a very positive uh, uh, legacy. You know, I think we're always, it's hard for, you know, I think it's probably hard for Paul to even accept, you know, to even to deal with it, you know, that, yeah, you know, people still really like your records, you know, it's like that's, that's what it's all about. Isn't it? Not why we made them. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, um, let alone, you know, uh, you know, having issues with it all. I guess for you, the, the the nice vantage point with your time in that band and also Guns N' Roses is, am I right in maybe assuming that not being perhaps the focus of attention allows you to enjoy it for the purity of what it is? Because there's not that same, I don't know whether pressure is the right word, but you know, you're not as hung up on certain things as you sort of allude to there. You can kind of just appreciate yeah. the there, there's, there's, there's something There's something to that, sure, where, you know, where Paul or an Axel might be, you know, they might be the one under more the pressure to be the leader of the band and all that crap that goes along with that. Um, there, there'd be something to that, totally. Um, uh, especially in the Guns N' Roses aspect, where I was more of a team leader in kind of a way when I first started off, you know, um, if you will. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I have kind of been a look at it from somewhat the outside looking in and you know finding the beauty in it as we've gone along you know would you be the longest serving member of guns and roses apart from axel ever uh and dizzy right so yeah because i mean you were in there from what 98 is it 98 yeah to 2013 or 14 something in there Wow, so fifteen years. How did you get? How did you get the gig in the first place? That's quite a curveball. It must have presented itself <laughs> quite a left field. Yeah, pitch. my buddy, my buddy Josh Freeze was a drummer at the time. He was he was in the in the band, and um, and he asked me if I wanted to come audition. He said it'd be fun. It was just we kind of did it as a on a lark, and uh, I learned up like I think three or four songs and went out there and just played them just for fun. And I got the gig, um, you know, pretty much the next day, just after talking to Axel about it. What happened with it, which was, which is why I, I chose to do it, really, was that in terms of what his goal was, um, he still had the name. He owned the name. And he kind of looked at it as, well, those fucking guys abandoned me, so I'm fucking going to still do it. I'm still fucking going to be Guns N' Roses. And the way he presented it seemed... <laughs> more punk rock than anything i'd heard and i thought all right i'm in let's do it you know and that was kind of how it how i joined that um you had to respect that tenacity fuck yeah i did and i did totally um and you know have nothing but you know good 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 things to say about it i mean sure we butted heads on things and it wasn't the easiest gig at all times but uh um you know it was a good experience i got a lot out of it I mean, I can only imagine, uh, you know, from <clears throat> the stuff that would follow the band around the sort of early 2000s in particular of, you know, arriving on stage X amount of hours late and all of that, all the sort of bad press that follows that. And then the yeah. whole Chinese democracy saga. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. there's been another record in the history of recorded music that uh, has created as much confusion and <laughs> curiosity and, and yeah. talking as that and to be front row to all of that what an amazing experience really as you say as long as it's positive you can just look at that and go wow what are yeah you yeah no i look back at that all of that fondly it was a crazy beautiful mess i mean really um yeah i mean that that jimmy i even pulled that record out of axel's hand at the fucking 11 30th hour is the only disappointing part of that but you know i don't know if it would have changed anything about the public's view of it i think it would have the only thing it would have changed would have been axel's view of it um you know he was like this close to being able to sign off on that fucking thing and they pulled it just before he was completely ready to be just going i'm done with it it was just a little too quick on that. Um, 
that's unfortunate but uh you know all things considered you know i think it made it we made a great record what are some of your favorite moments on the album in terms of you know either your parts or just song song parts themselves or the whole or man it was it was a lot of work getting that many people from different backgrounds to make something that ultimately axel produced he he took all of us sort of retarded kittens and kind of corralled us in a way that made us uh write together and work together in a way and i it was it, to his credit a lot to his credit that he was able to kind of uh navigate that in a way um and it's certainly my takeaway of that whole experience is that that's the most special thing is to like be able to collaborate with people from completely different backgrounds and uh musical you know backgrounds as well um and to come up with an album that we're all part of uh, intrinsically i think it was a, it's a huge huge uh uh a huge nod to his his uh his talent yeah he's a super unique dude man and i think there's a few people who i've spoken to who've kind of worked closely with him and are on good terms with him who have you know an insight into his true character and he seems like you know an honorable man at the core yeah. of all the madness um which i guess is for some people i think the most important thing i think it certainly is for me with the people in my life is like what's their heart like are they a good person yeah no exactly exactly totally think that um i agree uh did you end on on good terms was it like a kind of amicable parting of ways and what was the reason for your eventual decision to step away and, and close that door um i had a young daughter and a divorce i was going through that made it impossible for me to tour at that period and as that was happening the replacements were talking about getting together and doing weekend you know festival shows so I had to I had to make a decision and I had to you know look at my kid and I had to I had to make a very tough decision and walk away. Um I wouldn't have walked away probably had that uh that circumstance presented itself with my daughter and my divorce pending and all the stuff that was going on at that time. So uh unfortunate as it was, you know, for me especially at that time, I can't help but think if Axel really were to sit back and look at it, he would be thankful that I quit when I did because he went on to do ACDC, which was a fantastic thing for him to do. And um, I saw and, that. I saw that show in London. and I thought he did such an incredible job. I thought yeah. and I, I can't help but feel from my limited perspective as well, like him stepping outside of his own universe where he's the god into somebody else's even bigger universe where he's not i can't help but feel like that humbled him and gave him a new appreciation of the band dynamic and, and then you look at the series of events and where that band are now and who's in it now i can't you know the phrase everything happens for a reason i'm a believer in and when you look at the grand tapestry of you know everything you've done since gnr as well and we'll, we'll get to the more recent stuff momentarily but like your path since then and and his and that bands and obviously the replacement bits can't help but think maybe it did all definitely work out for the best for all parties right oh totally totally i, I yeah i would be, be hard pressed to find a reason that you could give me that it wouldn't have because <laughs> it, it, you know, it really seemed like he flowered after that which is great how uh did you and paul reconnect or were you ever you know estranged to begin with like where, where does the seeds for the reunion begin truly we we never were estranged we and we always kept in touch to some degree and and um we're always on friendly terms i mean we're still I mean, we're still on friendly terms for that matter but i haven't talked to him in a couple of years but that's not uh, unusual for us either um i think you know the only thing of regret really is that maybe we uh, extended that we probably overstayed our welcome a little, little bit on the on that reunion tour um in terms of what you know what it meant what we were supposed to do and you know all that and i think uh i think ultimately we would have been better off not going as long as we did and just kept it at the that kind of a fun little 
tip your toe in the water kind of thing. Jesse was out on some of those shows with you as well, right? Didn't he do the roundhouse gig in London? Was that? Yeah, I think he did one of those. Yeah. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, because my, my yeah. girlfriend at the time was his agent and we didn't get to go to the show. Or I didn't get to go to the show because I was away for it and I was gutted because, yeah, it was the roundhouse, one of my favorite venues. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah, replacements like with, with Jesse yeah. and support. Mm hmm. Yeah. Still never seen you. The question is, am I likely to, <laughs> or is or is that done? Do you think? Yeah, I'd probably. That's probably done. Yeah. I mean, I, I I never I never close the door, but you know I can't see us doing it again. But that's the day. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> uh, Bash and pop. So you kind of after the replacements finish, um, that first Bash and pop record is so great uh, and stands up so well. Um, was that your first time really kind of being chief songwriter in a, in a band and what was your enjoyment of that in that role and, and stepping out in that way? Cause it sounds like you're having so much fun on the album and. Yeah. And that was basically it. I, I was, I was given the opportunity to make that record and do my own thing. And, um, and, um, um, yeah, I was given the opportunity to do that and it worked out in a way that, um, I did have fun with that. It was fun. It was a good departure for me. What happened after that wasn't the greatest thing, but um, well, you is know, that just the band like didn't said, work out? Or, yeah, yeah, there were. You know, I had a hard time keeping it together, keeping 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 it moving forward and and evolving for no other reason than just the times and where I was at with it all. I actually moved to LA to kind of um, my you know I fell in love with someone else. One thing, but the other reason why is I really wanted to go to sort of be hands on when it came terms to uh, you know my putting out a record on warner brothers i had i had management and stuff but i just felt like i'm gonna get lost in the fucking shuffle here i gotta go out there and do something about it and so i did that um and i got lost in the shuffle anyway um which you know just happens um and you know i don't regret moving to la or any of that but um you know, it was it was it was a rough bit. I'm glad people still like that record, though. It's you know, it's great. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And that that Village Gorilla Head, the first solo album, is is brilliant as well. And again, just still stands up. And I like your songwriting, man. I think it's just so unique and and brilliant. And and over the years, obviously in different projects, it always I think sounds like you. You know, I don't think there's, <laughs> there's vast discrepancy between the different projects. Like it's always Tommy Stinson's kind of identity and fingerprints all over it um yeah that well, solo good. album was that a good experience making that one yeah 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 i mean i was you know that's what i made that in my downtime with guns and it was uh you know most of my records i've made in, in the downtime of some from another project or another group somehow um except for this last one this last one i've just kind of focused on you know uh, with cowboys and campfire focus on that mostly without any other uh any other distractions i did the i did the bash and pop you know record and and the second one or whatever and tour behind that but i really after that focused on on you know my personal life but also uh uh making the cowboys and campfire record so is somebody uh practicing violin yes they are i love it i thought so I yeah. was like, hang on love that who's, <laughs> who's that is that your kid so are you kidding no your no no it's my partner. girlfriend <laughs> it's my girlfriend back so then. you're still very much surrounded by music love it i am i am i am i'm not i'm not done yet um who's um who's chip then what's your history what's what's his story so yeah so you know we didn't cross paths but played a lot of the same places in the you know in the east coast in the 80s he more on the country rock side of things than me he was kind of a the philadelphia's you know guitar hero guy that kind of uh would be the the guitar player of uh of of the day whenever someone um a country artist would come to town to play club gigs and stuff like that they'd call chip to fill in and stuff like that he was the guitar slinger so when i moved when i moved to philly and met him he's my ex-wife's uncle we became fast friends and we started writing together about 14 years ago how old is um, he then uh he's a little older he's like 70. Right. just turned 70. um and um you know we became fast friends and just kind of got into it right away and have been that way since 
The only complaint I've got about the album, dude, is it's too short. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, right, get, I was yeah. really getting into it, and I was like, oh, man, it's over already. I really <laughs> like it. Like, I'm a big fan of, I mean, I don't know if you like a lot of country music or not, but it seems like there's more of a kind of country tinge to this record than any previous work you've done. And I just really like that side of, of American folk music. And I think that, um, you know, your songwriting skills lend themselves very well to that genre. And, um, oh, well, know, thank you. The, the, the I, instrumentation's yeah. really interesting. And yeah, well, thank yeah. you. I, I, I have a, a reverence for all kinds of music. I, I don't have a, my, you know, my, if you look at my playlist, I go from Glenn Miller to fucking black flag and a heartbeat and everything in between. So, um, yeah, I, it's, it's not on, it's not, it's not by accident, nor is it on purpose that my records sound the way they do. It's just, I take in everything and yeah. how it comes, how it comes out of me with my abilities is kind of what becomes probably my sound, I guess, you know? You aspire to Glenn Miller and you sound more like, you know, Henry Rollins, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. And I, like I was thinking the other day that I was just kind of reflecting on it all and thinking, you know, I just still so much more I wanted to do so much more with it. And, and, you know, as I'm doing press for this record now um, and getting ready to do shows to support it and all that, um, I'm already, you know, I'm already thinking of my next adventure, you know. Always. Well, that's that's the case of the creative brain, I think, and, uh, and yeah. long, long may it continue and remain. Because um, yeah. I you. think the minute you're satisfied and done, then it's it's over, isn't it? You're like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Time I mean, to I'm, retire, was... and that's fine too. You know, when that day yeah. comes. Yeah, as long as you as long as you go, I've done all I've done. I'm happy with that, and you move on. Yeah, so be it. I just, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so tell me about Tom Waits before I let you go. Um, what was that like getting to hang out, spend time? And, and you did like, rec did you record or just jam? What, what, what was the exchange? We recorded with, we recorded with him. We recorded with him uh, on the uh, Don't Tell Us Solely debacle. Um, no, he's a sweetheart of a guy. He uh, really, um, yeah, he, such a sweetheart he came in and you know worked with us and told the stories and we had fun with him and i got to run into him a few other times after that um in different occasions like uh when they did the storytellers show on uh, vh1 i think it was in 90 no it was in like 99 or 2000 um i got tickets for that and i went with robin fink guns and roses and and uh his wife and Paz, who's the bass player for pixies right now she was my date on that even though we weren't dating she just really wanted to see the show and we had, we happened to have an extra ticket because i got them through bill uh, bill flanagan from musician who's a buddy of mine who produced that show so um it was amazing and, and what was really fun about that um it, because I've run into him so many times, I've had small talk with him. I've never like sat down and I like, had a major hang with him. Although I can see that happening at some point, uh, I'd love to do that. But uh, after the show, we get to go back and say hi to Tom, and you know, it was me and Robin and Paz and 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 Robin's wife, and we're walking up the stairs. And there's Kathleen, Tom's wife. You know, oh, hi, Tommy, how you doing? You know, and Robin's like, what? Like, you actually? He thought it was lying that I knew him. You know. So we go up in the room and Tom's there. Hey, Tommy, how are you? You know, and, and just kind of blew my, uh, Robin's mind grapes a little bit. And it was funny. It was a funny, uh, funny exchange. He really thought I was lying about it all. So he's such a Tom Waits fan. But um, it was kind of a special moment. Um, but he's a really, I mean, I, I saw some, I saw this really funny thing that he did um, with Bob Dylan. It was a radio show thing. I know it very well with the exchange of voice note um, answer machine messages where they're talking about. No, pigeon. not that. Yeah, and that's the one where Tom calls him up and tells him about. Um, uh, they were, they were, um, they were. I think they were Jewish jokes. He told. Um, it was I can't remember what it was. There were Jew, there were Jewish anecdotes that were. Um, 
funny Jewish sayings. That's what it was. There were funny Jewish sayings. You got Tom talking about it. And it's just, it's just, it's gut splitting. It's so funny. But he just, he goes in, I think it was like 10 of them that he talks about um, that, uh, or Yidd- Yiddish sayings or something. It was funny. Yeah, that's shit. what it is. Yeah. yeah. I think it's on YouTube, all of that. It's the Bob Dylan theme time radio hour. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Set it up by saying, "I'm a good friend." Tom Waits keeps leaving me little answer phone messages, and let's see what he's going yeah. to say. And then he'll like play him. It's like, "Hey, Bob, it's Tom." It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, so good, so so good. So for <laughs> for you, like you know, because you've obviously been in in arenas with you know superstars and and situations with icons. And is there anybody out there that you uh, like? You know, still a fanboy kid around? Like, have you been in that situation where you've been like, "Oh my god, I can't believe it," so and so. Or are you at a level now where everybody's a human and you kind of just feel like you can hold court and be? You a know, it's it's funny you should say that um, because I have. I mean, I've hung out with David Bowie. I've hung out and you know shot the shit with Keith Richards. Um, I've hung out and chatted with Bob Dylan. I mean, fuck, who else is there really? I mean, Paul McCartney would probably be an interesting hang. I would think, um, but yeah. No, I I really do look at um, as, uh, artists as the way I kind of look at myself in a way, just a regular dude doing a gig, doing a thing that we do that we love. And some of them are more successful than others, and some of them are, um, you know, just different one way or the other. But I don't really view them uh, in the same sort of reverence. I think as non musician music fans, I, I I just look at them as people. I, Sitting there talking to Bob Dylan, you know, when we were making um, All Shook Down, uh, at, you know, at, at Ocean Way Studios in LA, it's it was just a magical. He goes, Hey, hey, Tommy, come here, you know, and walked in. I started talking to him for like 45 minutes while we're cutting tracks in the other room, and and uh, he was super sweet and just asked, he wanted to know what Minneapolis was like these days and all that. Because he's from there, right? Special. Yeah, originally. Yeah. So when you when you spend you know that kind of moment with icons like david sitting next to david bowie on a couch and he's asking me about how my life is going and all that stuff and really seemed interested it's like you go like he's just a regular guy he's like kevin just to chat with me like you can't really look at them differently after that moment you know um maybe frank sinatra would have been another story altogether that's a bit different probably (laughs) But yeah, I think anyone that I'd have that kind of feeling for would be dead by now. Yeah, I think as well, often the bigger the star, the more, as you say, kind of humble they are because they've got nothing to prove and nothing to show. And, um, you know, I think if anything, they just crave normality, right? Because if you're surrounded by the madness of fame enough, then I think it can just get, you know, so boring and old. And you're like, I just want a regular conversation with a regular dude. Well, well, yeah, and, and when you when you really break it down, we're all we're all doing the same fucking thing. Some of us are just more successful and have more, you know, more crap to deal with because of that per se. But really, we're just people. I mean, artists and whatnot. I mean, sure, there's a special quality to artists, I guess, in a way. But I'll still fucking put our shoes on the, you know, on our feet the same, and you know, <laughs> maybe some people use butlers for that. I don't know. <laughs> well my friend said it in a very crass way he's like we're all mammals and we all pass you know liquids and solids in the same way you know yeah, basically <laughs> basically dude well congratulations it, on uh on a great new record and, and and you know what a what an amazing ride so far and and long may it continue and yeah thank you so much for your time this morning tommy and, and thank you for the music first and foremost i've been a huge fan of your stuff for many years so it was a real pleasure to sit down and and shoot the shit with you this morning. I'm I'm grateful for the time. Cool, man. Thank you so much. You have yourself a great weekend. You too. And uh, well, hopefully yeah. see you soon.